welcome to senadiban education foundation once again education is not the answer to question education is the means to the answer to all questions actually we started this education program way back in 2012 and we released a, a set of educational videos and it was released by none other than uh, dr sion han kim from korea he was a colorectal surgeon he came to trivandrum and uh, launched senadiban education foundation then onwards he started uh, having free fellowship programs six months and one year fellowship program in basic and advanced uh, laparoscopy surgeries initially we had contact classes uh, and uh, hands on training for laparoscopy surgery with the advent of covid we made into online uh, programs and actually the logo was released by none other than uh, professor palani velu how i welcome professor palani velu sir chairman gem group of hospitals and research center and the founder president amasi for releasing the logo of senadipan education foundation then we started live surgeries in online platform both in youtube and facebook live the first facebook live was uh, uh, we did it in april that was a anti resection laparoscopically then we did a laparoscopy bipple in youtube and the link was shared to the members of senadipan education foundation we uh, are in, in july one ways we started having live lectures with the world class leaders and uh, from uh, december on we started having um, e certificates for the online programs in the social media we have almost 10 on uh, whatsapp groups almost full and we have a uh, facebook group of uh, senadiban education foundation and now it is more than uh, 800 members in the season 1 we conducted uh, 20 28 webinars with the world leaders uh, in surgery and gynecology and we have a good uh, global acceptance actually uh, mostly more than 50 countries countries participate and uh, this is one of the largest uh, uh, virtual uh, platforms in the world and uh, this is one of the uh, split up of viewers um, more than 1000 uh, people are uh, logged in from more than 56 countries so we have a uh, youtube channel also uh, all the webinar videos are available in the youtube which is free now we have two eminent people in the field of gynecology especially gynec onco surgery is none other than professor shailashree from tata memorial hospital world was with the minimal access surgery both in laparoscopy surgery and robotic surgery and professor nirja badla is there from all india institute of uh, Uh, medical science india uh, the one of the premier institute in india uh, both of them will be introduced by dr uh, nisha nishant who is a gynecologist uh, in trivandrum jubilee mission hospital so um, before starting let me ask the participants to mute their mic on entry if possible kindly acknowledge your device by your name participants logging from outside india are requested to reveal their identity in the chat box raise your hand if you want to intervene everybody will be given permission to unmute their mic if you want to speak in between or uh, after the session if you are on a portable device please mute your audio and hide your video please mute or and hide your video when the presenter is presenting because the clarity of video will be more if you hide your videos while the speaker is presenting the next webinar we are conducting on uh, 11th of april by none other than uh, the king of uh, rectal surgery he is the one who coined the name total uh, total mesorectal excision and uh, he revolutionized the rectal cancer surgery by identifying the holy plane of yield professor r j hield himself is presenting in senadiban education foundation uh, next webinar you can contact me uh, in senadiban at gmail.com and i am handing over the mic to dr nisha for introducing the moderator and the speaker now uh, 154 people have lo- uh, logged in more people are expected dr nisha 
थैंक यू सर तो गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन आई एम सुपर एक्साइटेड टू हैव यू ऑल हियर एंड एक्साइटेड अबाउट द वंडरफुल टॉक वी गेट टू हैव टूडे टूडे वी हैव टू अमेजिंग सर्जन्स विद अस फ्रॉम टू प्रीमियम इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ इंडिया professor shailesh t t s from tata memorial hospital mumbai and professor neerja batla from aims delhi when i say amazing i truly mean it uh, let me walk you through their profiles professor shailesh t t s she is currently working as professor and consultant gynec oncologist tata memorial hospital she worked as consultant gynec oncologist in cardiff university hospital uk and she is a fellow of royal college of obstetricians and gynecologists and she is an accredited gynec oncologist of british society of gynec oncology and she is an accredited trainer and member of british society of colposcopy she is a member of various international gynec oncology organizations and she is first author of two cochrane reviews in gynec oncology and she is a team member of core team in developing national and international guidelines in gynec oncology she has done more than 100 presentations in international meetings and she had led live and cadaver skill training courses in gynec oncology in uk and in india He, she is an examiner teacher and teacher for mch gynec oncology india and her areas of uh, interest are robotic and laparoscopic surgery in gynec oncology fertility preserving surgeries in young women with cancer and quality of life issues in cancer survivors and clinical research and preventive medicine and professor neerja batla uh, she is a relentless clinician who has dedica dedicated her life for protecting indian women for, from cervical cancer she is currently additional professor department of obstetrics and gynecology aims and adjunct faculty member clinical epidemiology unit aims and she is a graduate and post graduate from uh, aims delhi and she is in on the faculty since 1989 uh, she had uh, her uh, fellowship from university of cape town on community based screening programs and she worked in collaboration with international agency for research on cancer lyon france and john hopkins bloomberg school of public health usa she has successfully undertaken research projects in india on cervical scan cancer screening in low resource settings hpv epidemiology hpv vaccine trials and she is a member of several committees on issues of cervical cancer prevention she has published over 90 papers in national and international journals and she has contributed to figo guidelines she has written chapters in books and monographs and edited a textbook of gynecology on she is a vice president of aogin and she is the founder president of aogin india so we have seen uh, the evolution in the field of gynec oncology for the past two decades uh, there has been a huge shift uh, from open surgery to uh, conventional laparoscopy and now now we are in the era of robotics so uh, it's a privilege to have the topmost leaders in the field with us today to share their immense knowledge and uh, expertise with us i would like to welcome you both to this webinar organized by senadipans education foundation and it is not fair to go without saying a great thank you to dr senadipan who took the pain to uh, the organize this most relevant uh, talk for the gynec fraternity across the world thank you sir thank you dr nisha for the nice words and thank you for introducing the stalwarts in gynecology gynec onco surgery uh, actually we announced this program on women's day march 8th we announced the program which all the women all all the women leaders of gynecology and the field uh, and uh, we are actually excited to uh, hear from dr shailashri and the discussion uh, with uh, dr nirja badla over to uh, dr nirja badla for the proceedings thank you
Thank you, Dr. Baiju, for having us here today. And thank you, Nisha, although that introduction was a little bit outdated, but it's OK. It doesn't matter so much. Uh, it's really exciting to have uh, Shaila here today. You know, uh, I was looking at her uh, bio being read out. And of course, I've known Shaila for many years now. And I was reminded of the, what our honorable vice president says all the time, Sri Venkaya Naidu. He says, go abroad, earn, learn, and return. So that is exactly what Shaila has done. She has got the best of training and she has come back to make a real mark, a real mark on the Indian gynae oncology scene. So I think without any further ado now, I will ask her to start her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Nirja, for the kind um, introduction. And uh, thank you, Nisha. Thank you, sir. Um, shall I share screen now? Please. Just a minute. Had a relaxing Sunday. Sorry. I would like to. Can you see? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And uh, is the whole screen seen or do I need to? No, it's no, fine. No. Yeah, it's, yeah, the whole screen is seen. Yeah, it's proper. Okay, thank you. Thank the organizers for the kind invite. This is the order of my presentation today. For the first 20 minutes, I will present slides on evidence for MIS in GYN cancers. And next 20 minutes, videos on common MIS procedures we do on a day to day basis. This is the Cochrane Review 2018 showing all the square boxes. Can you hear me? Yes. Something happened. I do not know what happened. This is the Cochrane Review 2018 showing all the square boxes crossing unity, making the blue diamond sit in a neutral position. The most significant study with a weight of 73% is the lab trial, large sample size and narrow confidence interval as you can see there, has made this red block very impressive. It's very difficult to compare with, um, um, compete with this trial. Based on all the existing evidence, all the professional bodies have declared MIS as the preferred route for early stage endometrial cancer. Understandably, the jury is uncomfortable for MIS in advanced disease. Um, lymph node metastasis is excluded. You can still do an MIS in endometrial cancer with lymph node best metastasis. Um, it's more of peritoneal disease where uh, uh, people are worried. This is the only data I have of my experience in surgery in obese endometrium from Cardiff University Hospital, where I used to work in my past life. It was presented in the British Gynae Cancer Society annual meeting a decade ago. When we looked at the BMIs for patients with stage one endometrial cancer, we found that the vast majority of them were obese. Two thirds of them were either severely obese or morbidly obese. Imagine doing a midline laparotomy on a 60 BMI or offering her radiotherapy. Nightmare in TMH, we do get a handful of class two obese, hardly class three obese patients in a year. We had performed around 200 cases over a period of five years, out of which 65 were, uh, around 65 were very obese. Mean BMI was 45.8 more than all the popular trials quoted at that point of time. The evaluate trial, the OBIMA trial, the LAP uh, trial. Conversions were around 68% and complications around 6 to 6% uh, with a median length of stay 2 to 3%, 2 to 3 days even in the extremely obese. There is a learning curve for, the, uh, for this particular surgery, especially in extreme obese patients. So two of us consultants, Dr. Lim and myself, used to operate together first few couple of years till we went past the learning curve so that we could operate independently. 
The fashionable toy these days in endometrium is central lymph nodes. These are some of the popular trials, all showing good NPV. It's important to get bilateral central nodes to improve the negative predictive value. Initial studies use dual injections of colloids and blue dye, but recent trials have moved on to ICG, uh, called the, um, which is popularly called it the green dye for its better physical properties compared to methylene blue. Understandably, almost all central nodes for endometrium are based along the obturator fossa and iliac vessels below the pelvic brim. Fundal large growths, there might be a chance they go along the round ligament sometimes to the inguinal um, uh, nodes or ovarian vessels above the IMA. So these are the standard guidelines uh, for lymphadenectomy in endometrium. Low risk, no need for lymphadenectomy, low intermediate risk, central lymph node is adequate. We have to pass the learning curve before we start doing central nodes in uh, women. High intermediate and high risk systematic BPLND in most cases is, will suffice and in some cases will require parietic nodes. Let's move on to the most controversial topic of the decade, MIS in early cervical cancer. You can see my opinion, it's um, there for all of you to see. I'll give you a minute. Truly, this is my opinion. One good RCC, the LSSC trial, one CR analysis and many retrospective studies after LAC trial showed inferior disease-free survival and overall survival. It was shocking, it is shocking, but it's true. Open surgery touching average 95% DFS, DFS and MIS hovering between 85 to 90% making the hazards ratio tremble. After that, there was flooding of retrospective and world data and literature and this meta-analysis in JAMA Oncology published in 2020 showed right wing getting stronger and stronger. If you carefully look at the top three older studies, they were bordering on neutral results, crossing unity, but subsequent studies all started showing the square green boxes to right, making the pale diamond swing completely right. I feel the st uh, studies initially were operated by a few expert surgeons and later on too many surgeons joined the bandwagon of MIS and maybe that skewed the results. Again, that's my opinion. To our relief, then came even bigger studies, some retrospective and some from population registries, trying to find out what went wrong with MIS cervix. Uterine manipulation and exposure of the exophytic growth during colpotomy might have spread the cancer cells into the high pressure abdominal cavity. It makes sense to me and also it rings a bell to anyone who has, had, who has performed MIS cervix. The real world data for three countries, Scandinavian and Dutch, showed no difference in overall survival and DFS from their population-based registries, which are considered the best registries in the world. To add to the masala, this multi-center oriental study came up recently, emphasizing non-inferiority of MIS in less than two centimeter tumors. Again, confirming the belief that the large friable growth sitting on the cervix is probably the culprit in the whole suspense of MIS in cervix. Now, MIS surgeons have decided to prove that MIS cervix cannot be buried forever. So these are the ongoing international RCTs. This is the space we need to watch in the coming years. The results of these studies will either revive or bin MIS cervix in the coming decade. There are no RCTs for tracheolectomy, only observational good studies which have shown no difference in overall survival. Again, if you look at it, it looks like less than two centimeter probably is the one variable deciding the hazards ratio for uh, cervical cancer. We can do lymphadenectomy by MIS, as most patients in the trial said negative notes, and so hopefully the root wouldn't have contributed to negative outcomes. Serpec N0 is my trial on MIS and open from TMH. It's a retrospective propensity match analysis of the last six, seven, eight years. We have performed minimal access surgery. It's still in the IRB. 
for advanced cervical cancer, MIS surgical training of parietic and common iliac above PRIM is level two evidence. We are awaiting the LILACs RCT results. I have put up a phase two feasibility study at TMH on the same topic. Uh, it is approved by the IRB. I'm waiting for funding. And if anybody here is rich, you can grant me some funding for me to start the study. Uh, central nodes for cervix are generally lurking in the obturator fossa and along iliac vessels, mostly below the bifurcation of common iliacs. Centicol 1, 2, and 3, and Centex are validation studies for central nodes in cervix. The take home message with all these studies is frozen section is inaccurate for central node biopsy. Identification of bilateral central nodes is very important to get the negative predictive value to near 100%. Now, this is very important here because unlike endometrium, node positive disease is fatal for cervix. It's, it's almost similar to vulva. So we have to be careful when we say that we are not going to proceed with the lymphadenectomy based on central node, sentinel lymph node biopsy. So the NPV becomes uh, at most importance in, um, in cervix and vulva. Coming to ovary, for advanced ovary, there is data on many feasible studies in IDS setting. These are some of the studies which uh, are uh, basically phase two studies showing good trends towards overall survival and similar recurrence rates. This is only in IDS setting. This is an RCT um, uh, for MIS ovary, advanced ovary. Uh, we need to um, watch this space uh, for the results. So the summary for MIS advanced ovary is feasibility studies are showing non inferior results in IDS setting. Patient selection criteria needs to be defined, especially in primary setting. Learning curve, I feel we should not make the same mistake as LACC, uh, especially in primary cytoreductive surgery because it's, surgically, it's, it's a surgical challenge. Primary cytoreductive surgery is a surgical challenge. MIS, especially in MIS setting. MIS lymphadenectomy can only be evaluated once feasibility shows non-inferior outcomes, but the oncological benefit of systematic lymphadenectomy in advanced ovary itself is doubtful, whether it's open or MIS, it doesn't matter. Now coming to suspicious adenexal mass, this is the only scenario where I don't um, use my MIS skills or I'm hesitant to use MIS skills. Germ cell tumors, mucinous tumors, large size suspicious complex ovarian masses. Now, what do we do with them? So what I teach the residents or what I do regularly is put a very small incision, pack the abdomen with lots of mops, mops so that any little spill will be, soaked, uh, will be soaked by the mop and not doesn't go into the abdominal cavity. We do a very, very slow decompression of the cyst without spill. I tell my residents not to push and prod on the ovarian mass uh, when, when I'm trying to do the suction. We remove the mops uh, so that the spill, any spill is taken out. Generally, there are no spills if you do it very carefully. We keep a thorough wash, wait for frozen section reporting. And then we decide to proceed. If, if it needs to be proceeded, uh, depending on the frozen section, then we extend the incision. Remember, these are young women, so we have to be careful in what we do to them. Uh, we have to get the best oncological outcomes. At the same time, we can't give huge, horrible scars in their abdomen and jeopardize their um, marriage or whatever whatever social uh, uh, obligations they have in life. This is the summary of MIS in gynae oncology. It's a self-explanatory slide. I'll give a minute for you guys to read. Um, to be honest, I feel the truth for MIS cervix lies between the learning curve and the tumor spill. If you get the learning curve and the tumor spill right, it probably will end up with good results. Many of my MCH residents after passing out used to ask me, Madam Meravardhan bleeds in the last quarter of my surgery. Initially, it goes beautifully well. The last two to three centimeters, one centimeter of the ureter, it bleeds. And what do I do about it? So I thought of writing this article. I drew this drawing myself and I called it one point perspective drawing. It's a painter's analogy. If anyone uh, paints, they understand immediately what I mean. There's an horizon and everything starts from the horizon and it spreads. So if you look carefully, what makes radical hysterectomy difficult is not the ureter. We have concentrated on the ureter in uh, radical hysterectomy for a long time. It's always the pains. 
veins in the lateral parametria. If you look at the bottom picture, the, the, the triangle, you'll see all the veins in the parametria are like lateral parametria uh, rather than posterior parametria or anterior parametria. Um, they are like tributaries of River Ganga wrapping the ureter, I feel, and we have to somehow get the uh, separate the ureter from these veins, and it's not an easy task. The next uh, area of difficulty while doing a radical hysterectomy is to try to find these white hair like structures forming the inferior hypogastric plexus. To some extent, uh, getting the sympathetic a little high up at the brim is much easier than trying to find it uh, below, but at least it's, it's still recognizable compared to parasympathetic. Many get confused between Okawashi and Yabuki spaces. They are the same spaces running um, posterior to the ureters, inferior and posterior to the ureters, be divided by deep train veins. Remember the paravesicle and the pararectal spaces which we start off with in Vardhimes as beginners is basically the same space divided by the uterine vessel complex and similarly these nerve spaces are divided by the deep uterine vein and we need to be careful uh, with the deep uterine vein because uh, the anatomical um, anatomically you might have more than one deep uterine vein in that area. These are my own pictures from uh, uh, the publication, uh, trying to show uh, nerve spaces and uh, the deep uterine vein. So, so far we have looked at um, the clinical effectiveness of MIS. Now let's look at money, vitamin M. I worked in national health services in the UK and TMH all my life, so I'm not good at this costing mechanism. So actually a kind friend gave me this slide. Um, there is no need to put any convincing argument as it's very, very obvious to anybody for that matter, um, which procedure is costly at present. I'm not talking about future, at present, which procedure is costly. I generally call robo a karodpati and a, lap, and a laparoscope a lapati. So that, that uh, says it all. Few pictures on port placement before I start showing the videos. This is these are lap ports with this placement. You can do pelvis and common iliac nodes till aortic bifurcation easily. If you place the camera port two centimeters above the umbilicus, then you can reach IMA and also do infracolic mentectomy in a thin patient. Generally, I place 10 mm ports in midline most of the times to prevent future herniation. It's my gentle gynae um, training, I would say. Uh, this is a self-explanatory slide. Make sure the cameraman and surgeon are standing on the same direction to prevent mirror imaging. Assistant is lifting the peritoneal folds or the sigmoid or the duodenum and is generally static. This retroperitoneal technique is very useful in obese patients. To create retroperitoneal space with your index finger, you need 12 mm index and incision. So a balloon port is ideal to prevent gas leak. Generally, you work with two side ports. Umbilical port is used initially for looking in the abdomen for staging and completing hysterectomy and pelvic lymphadenectomy. You have to go past the learning curve for this procedure as everything is upside down when you go in. Since most of us, the ureter is on the roof, the vessels are at the bottom. Since most of our patients are not highly obese, this particular procedure is underutilized in India. These are the robotic ports. The first pick, no need to read off. You can go easily till the IMA and do all your pelvic and lower paratic lymphadenectomy and hysterectomy, etc. The second pick is when I perform pelvic and paratic still the renal hilum. Uh, I place the ports below the umbilicus. Here, when we do this, the you're very too close to the pelvis, I agree, but somehow I can operate well in the pelvis even if I'm squeezed. Um, for space, as that is my comfort area for a long time. And upper abdomen, I feel I need more space and more working space and, uh, and, and more comfort. Uh, so this this port placement helps um, above IMA um, lymphadenectomy. This is a green hopper I clicked um, a couple of years back. Um, Close, closer, closest is what I went, uh, and suddenly I, th I saw this green hopper looking completely different um, uh, with the uh, with the pictures. 
Uh, this is how I compare all the three methods. Robotics, the facts are excellent. Magnification learning curve is much superior. It's good for old eyes, and uh, but you see more than necessary. This nice green hopper, which looked harmless, starts looking like a predator when you go to closer. And also you feel very lonely sitting in a corner operating with robotic and shouting inside the drum, I feel. And the team, maybe, I do not know, they are bored. And sometimes I feel we de-skill them because they're standing for two, two, three hours or four hours trying to assist us. And, and there's not much assistance in robotic. So the residents, I feel, um, they might lose on their training. And obviously it's a big hole in the wallet of a patient that we need to remember always. Thank you very much. I'll move on to the videos now. I will show a few uh, next 20 minutes, uh, a few videos and uh, we can take up question and sessions after that. Thank you. Have I stopped uh, sharing now at this point? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can uh, stop sharing and uh, take the video and uh, start resharing it. So share screen for video, okay. Uh, meanwhile, somebody who has raised their hand, we don't see the name, hmm. uh, English at least. And can you please put your questions in the chat box meanwhile? We'll definitely have a chance to speak later. Sure, sure. Uh, actually, uh, two fourteen people are already joined. We are expecting more. Okay. So, um, can you hear me now? Yeah. So, what I do with the videos, I have all I pinned them all together so that the, I don't have to go back and forth uh, sharing the screen. No, and no. Um, uh, pardon me if some of the videos suddenly appear um, different from what I was doing. So there are clips of uh, the common surgeries which we do, pelvic lymphadenectomies, um, above the obturator nerves, below the obturator, obturator nerves in uh, layer dissections or extended resections of the pelvis for uh, recurrent CA cervix. Then we have, I have a uh, few cuts on how to cut the vagina, which, is, which I feel many residents need to learn because that's the gas is leaking and then um, they start uh, panicking uh, when they do a colpotomy. And the other videos I've had, I've uh, posted are the uh, parietic notes, both laparoscopic and, uh, and robotic. And then we move on to, I think I've put in a groin node dissection and also laparoscopic ovarian transposition because I feel because in a in, in surgical group, the indications have been underutilized in a surgical oncology group for laparoscopic ovarian uh, transposition, especially in, uh, in um, um, colorectal cancers and uh, Ewing sarcoma, lymphomas, etc. So that's the sequence. Um, and also a few steps on radical hysterectomy. I do not know how it, uh, whether it's going to be useful anymore, but at least for modified radical hysterectomies, which we do for endometrial cancers at present, those steps will be useful. And anyway, it's better to learn um, lateral pelvic anatomy well uh, uh, if you want to operate on radical if in five years or six years down the line if you get the evidence right. So back to video recording. So the first one is, okay. The first, can you see the screen? Yeah, you can see. So, um, is it not working? Not working. Arrow, arrow. Where is the arrow? I Over the arrow. See. Middle part, middle part. I can't see the arrow only here. <laughs> no, middle part. Middle part of that part. Ah, oh, that way. There's a blob coming here. Huh? No, it went back. Sorry. I can't see the arrow myself, that's a problem. Now I can uh, open that uh, video file. Okay. Go back. Approve. 
Uh, now we are seeing two files. One is the PowerPoint already presented, and okay. the other one is the video. I, I need to. Uh, that's what I did last time as well. I, I need to close this PowerPoint, isn't it? No, we will do it from here. Yeah. Okay. Now. Okay. Now we will do it from. You just uh, wait. Can you close the window? This window? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wait, wait. Can you share the screen? Yeah. Share screen. Yeah. Where is my presentation gone? This is a PowerPoint, which is. Uh, no, you just uh, press on the share screen button from your side. Yeah, I pressed on it, share. Yeah. And you can end this PowerPoint. Already, a PowerPoint is on. Yeah. 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 Okay. Now we can take the video. So the video is somewhere here inside this. Uh, it open just recently. Sorry, the Zoomers will would like to control. Uh, that is from our side. No, uh, just uh, deny. Yeah, open. Uh, okay, you can do it from um, your side. Why is it not? Uh, now we will do it once again. Sorry about that. I don't know what's happening. Can you please play again? Not the arrow, middle part, arrow from the bar. Can't see the bar. bar I can't. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, that bar. Yeah. yeah, it just goes when she clicks yeah. that. Oh. Same thing happened before. Okay, okay. Same thing happened last time also. Can you share the screen again? Share screen. Yeah, I share screen and I do this. And yeah. I... no, this top share is coming in my way. That's why when I go there, it. Oh, is it? Then That's you can put the bar, uh, the bar somewhere. The bar is not moving. Uh, okay, 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 okay. Got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Can you still see the bar? No, isn't it? No, no bar is there, but the thing is that the uh, uh, stop sharing us on the bar only. Can you see the video play? Yeah, yeah. So basically, this is uh, not pre recorded. Um, um, we'll start with the simplest of the things. Um, we should not overhype surgical skills. That's my, uh, otherwise we'll end up like lack trial. Uh, we have to learn from the beginning slowly, uh, whether it looks like a simple surgery, we'll get used to seeing all posh surgeries sometimes um, on uh, web search and everything. And you think that you suddenly become a good surgeon one fine day. It takes many, many years to do that. So let's start with the pelvic lymphadenectomy, especially for gynecological cancer. This is the most important step. And if you see the white bone, the, uh, bone there, the anterior pubic rami, that's a very important bone in laparoscopic surgery or minimal access surgery to identify the obturator uh, nerve. And I'll tell you how. This is the lumbosacral approach going behind the psoas major. This is a useful technique uh, for obese patients, especially when you can't get into the uh, obturative fossa from that side, you can go from this side. And also it's a useful technique for layers and extended pelvic um, uh, resections. So the only thing which you need to be careful here is basically the, um, the perforators from the psoas and obturator internus muscle, mamasum. 
and they bleed. In open surgery, when something bleeds, you keep a swab, come out, and, and, and after two minutes, it stops, put pressure. Whereas in laparoscopy, it messes up with your view. And so you have to be very slow and very careful so that you don't mess up this nice white view. So I'm trying to separate the vessels from, uh, so the nodes from the external iliac artery and vein. And the bottom rim of the, this is what I teach my residents as well, the bottom rim of the anterior pubic rama is where the obturator nerve is. It's very, uh, 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 sometimes people keep going in the paravesical space lower than the obturator nerve and start searching for the obturator nerve. So it go to the white bone and track, track the white bone and next to it is the obturator nerve. So the obturator nerve is fairly, it's an easy procedure as long as you are careful that you're not poking the obturator vein at this place. The corner of it, this is, this is, this is the most important space. I say, I tell my residents, internal iliac vein, internal iliac artery and its branches, everybody comes at the, at the proximal end of obturator nerve. So it bleeds, so go slow. So this is minimum pelvic lymphadenectomy, which we do regularly for endometriums and for, uh, for uh, uh, services. I use a glove, uh, eight and a half glove thumb, cut the thumb and put it in low cost and keep all this uh, in the corner. And when you do the colpotomy, you can push it out of the vagina. If you are not doing the hysterectomy, in some cases, if I put an ovary in, some, you take out the port, pull this out, and put the port back in again. Now, coming to the lateral uh, wall dissection, generally, we don't need to uh, go below the obturator now unnecessarily. The reason being, it's not that you cannot operate there. Parasympathetic S2, S3, S4 comes in this region, and if it's not necessary in terms of oncological outcomes, uh, it's preferred not to get into this space. However, if there's a node, and also if you're doing a lateral extended uh, uh, resection for uh, CSRX recurrence, this is the area where you need to be, uh, care, you need to know the anatomy in this area very care, uh, uh, very well. This is the confluence of the internal and the external vein. And if you see carefully, there are too many things happening here at this point at the level of uh, by, uh, confluence of the veins, external and uh, internal iliac vein obturator veins, the main obturator vein. So you move the nodes below the obturator fossa slowly. I use like a shore throughout. It's a boon because it, it makes my life easier. Nothing bleeds. Now, the most important branch which comes in and around this area is the branch coming out of the internal iliac artery. And if you keep tracking it, that divides into this, this particular thing divides into internal pudendal artery and inferior gluteal artery. So we are used to superior vesicle and we are used to uterine vessels, but low down here in the obturator fossa, you get the internal pudendal and the um, inferior gluteal. So this takes us to the obturator internus muscle. And most of the times when you look at scans in cervical cancers, obturator internus muscle is spared. So you will be able to get most of the tissue out of um, this area without um, overdoing it. People have started going beyond internus muscle and uh, going into the, um, thick, uh, uh, into the bone spaces. Uh, we haven't moved to that uh, area still. So we are below, we are much, much below the obturator uh, nerve. And in here, we, I don't think we are now worried about the parasympathetics are all cut and ligated. Almost we can't see them with the two thin. And we are not doing a nerve sparing here at all. So we are taking the parasympathetic along with all this uh, lymphatic tissue. Till we reach the lumbosacral trunk. So internal pudendal artery is your, um, is your um, I would say, road map for identifying the lumbosacral trunk in the lateral pelvic wall, wall during um, lip layer procedures. So sciatic foramina, lumbosacral trunk, pudendal nerve, and lumbosacral trunk, S2, S3, S4, and the lumbar branch, which all join together to form the sciatic. So this is the anatomy, um, uh, which I've taken it from a, a 
internet picture basically. So you can see the uh, nerve space and you can see the uh, thing. Now this is a video on um, colpotomy. I know I've not put up the hysterectomy video because it's quite simple. Um, but I feel lower down when you're doing especially la laparoscopic uh, hysterectomy, people tend to cut the vagina very quickly before, after, do, after they do the uterine artery, they start cutting the vagina and, and the lateral vaginal angle starts bleeding and the gas starts leaking from the, uh, uh, from the uh, 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 cut mecha, uh, colpotomy. So, and the junior struggles and it looks like a simple hysterectomy, then it becomes complicated. So if you look here, I see, you can see the McCartney all around. You should see the McCartney all around when you do the vaginal cut. And most people start cutting from the anterior edge of the vagina. When you do that, the uterus falls back. And again, you're struggling to lift the uterus and your assistant and the bowels are all coming. So try to start from uh, whichever end, lateral end and go backwards first. Keep moving backwards, cut posteriorly first. With this, the uterus is sitting in front. It's not sitting backwards and keep the cervix always inside the McCartney. Remember the spill which happened in uh, lac trial, we have to be careful with endometriums as well, with high grade serous endometriums. We do not know actually what happens when we do all this. What is the spill? What is getting coming into this high pressured abdominal area? And later on, if there is a recurrence because of what we did. So we push in all the lymph nodes out into the McCartney tube. You can use any tube you want. There are lots of tubes, but I'm quite used to this. I you reuse it. So the next part is parietic lymphadenectomy. Um, this is a different patient, but I've um, put it together. This is a robotic one. So I start, I would have done my pelvic lymphadenectomy. So it becomes easier for me to start tracking the right ureter and going upwards. Um, so generally I start from the right side, looking at the right common iliac vessels and then move about, go above the vessels, keep going above the vessels till you come to the bifurcation of um, the iota. And then again, move upwards. So it's walking on the rope all along up till IMA or, uh, or renal vessels, whichever one is needed for the partic for particular patient. The general rule of thumb in endometrial cancers is if the pelvic lymph nodes are negative, the chances of parietic lymph nodes being positive is only 2%. If the pelvic lymph nodes are positive, the chance of parietic lymph nodes being positive is 50%, one in two. These are microscopic nodes. These are not enlarged nodes we are talking about. And we still do not know when do we call a lymphatic disease a systemic disease. When it moves, when, when pelvic nodes are positive and common iliac nodes are positive or when common iliacs are positive and IMA nodes are positive, we, we do not know what level of nodes, level one, two, three, four in, in abdomen, we still do not know. Common sense dictates, this is an IMA coming in. Um, common sense dictates that ovaries get um, attached to the, uh, uh, um, ovaries arise from the aorta between the IMA and the renal vessels. And the ovary is a gynecological organ. So, so the chances of the lymph nodes being at the level of um, gonadal vessels uh, may be higher if the pelvic lymph nodes are positive. If they're negative, I don't think that makes a difference. So the reason, uh, again, many people show um, uh, lots of beautiful videos on parietic lymph nodes, uh, but you should remember between the IMA and the renal vessels, there's a lot of important anatomy which comes into the picture. Some of these lymphatics, strong lymphatics, the chyle, everything moving into the chyle and hypogastric nerves coming in and duodenum and all those renal veins with their abnormal vasculature. So we have to be careful when we, when we say we are going to do everything because we might cause morbidity to the patient. Only if it's needed, if it's useful, go ahead and do it. Otherwise, be careful. So what I tell my residents is go slow on this. It's, 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 it's an, it's, it feels nice to operate like this, but at the end of the day, if you complicate a patient who would have lived forever with that endometrial cancer, um, it's not fair on her. So learn the trick properly or the technique properly and then start doing it. Don't look at other people's videos and start doing uh, lymphadenectomies, go IMEs.
the robotic one. Um, the pictures are magnified, so you see all the tiny vessels everywhere. So I'm going slow there. So ureter to ureter is your dissection. Most of the patients we have removed, these nodes are negative. Going underneath the tunnel, it's not the, the open method where, where sometimes we cauterize the duodenum. Always put a clip here. There are too many lymphatics. You realize when you're operating in the pelvis, you don't get so much lymph. The minute you start doing para, I think you almost start getting a well of uh, lymph already started uh, coming in when you're operating. You can see the um, watery substance there. That shows the lymphatics. So... On the right side, in the right parietic, um, left parietic area, because the IMA comes in between, you sometimes get nodes in between which go underneath the IMA, and uh, you have to be careful while doing this. This is a laparoscopic approach. Um, so I, I generally, it, it doesn't matter how, where you start, how you do, uh, if, you, if you know what you're doing. Um, you can delineate the renal vessels here or renal vein first so that you know where you're going and then start the dissection that become that uh, that way you are relieved that you've seen what you're supposed to see and then you start taking the lymph nodes above the vessels my assistant is shaking good cameraman is very important for laparoscopic surgery and uh, when you're in a teaching hospital every year we get new sets of residents and uh, I do not know whether I'm growing older or they are um, making the camera move. Um, I get a headache sometimes. <laughs> really? <laughs> the left renal coming in. Again, Maryland Liger Shore is a boon, I would say. To be honest, uh, it just made our lives easier compared to the uh, monopolar, bipolars we were using and uh, managing for a long time. And also the screens have become much, much better uh, with laparoscope. So it, it is, it's, it's a good technique. It needs to be learned, I think. The youngsters, I don't think you have any, any choice other than learning minimal access. It be outdated in 10 years if you don't learn. Now this video is on. Okay, this video again is the um, uh, same video trying to show the paravesical, pararectal spaces and the uterine tunnel, which are some of the important steps for uh, radical hysterectomy. Um, so you can do lymphadenectomy and go ahead and do radical. We generally do lymphadenectomy because if frozen section is negative, we don't proceed with radical hysterectomy, but not all places have frozen section facilities. So either way, it is okay. So you dissect the ureter from uh, the brim, but I would not separate the ureter so much at the brim because uh, it unnecessarily vas devascularizes the ureter. This is the uterine artery crossing the ureter, the tunnel, what is called the tunnel, water under the bridge. Um, I don't cut the uterine artery till the end because once you cut the uterine artery, it keeps on coming in your way and somebody has to hold it. Now look at those veins coming. There are two veins, one thin vein along with the uterine artery, which is the superficial vein. And you go deeper and see the deep uterine vein. The deep uterine vein goes below the ureter and superficial vein complex along with the artery goes above the ureter. I keep it buzzed so that it doesn't bleed by pull and push. The video is moving. So you, this is the space now, the bleeding space, I would call. Up, up till here, generally, Vardhyams is beautiful, nice. You can show off. And as soon as you go beyond the uterine artery and the tunnel is when all the veins, deep uterine veins and the vesicle veins 
There's a confluence below the ureter along with the nerves which bleeds. So this is a space which we need to look for. And that's the Okabayashi space which we are coming with. It is between the uterosacrals, lateral to the uterosacral. You lateralize the uterosacrals to the midline and push all the things which look white um, in this area towards the uh, uh, vessels. Sympathetic is easier to recognize if you go higher up in the brim, especially in the parietal fossa, it's much easier. It's nice and thick and strong and white. But as you come lower down here, it, it, it's sprayed. It, it looks, uh, the whole thing, the whole nerve system is not what you see in textbooks of yellow, yellow looking parasympathetic coming this way and sympathetic coming that way longitudinally. It is not as simple as that nerves. So this is the ultra deep uterine vein. I feel this is one vein I feel everybody needs to know where it comes, how, how, how it divides and how do we make sure that we get it right without getting the parasympathetic chain, which just runs underneath the uterine, deep uterine vein. See, it's branching into two as it going as it going towards the um, uterus. This is the ukaba, This is the yabuki space. Yabuki space this is the uterine vein. Sorry, I'll just stop it. This is the deep uterine vein. Ureter is here, and can you see my arrow? And um, this 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 space here is the yabuki space. If you see all these nerves which are going in the ukabayashi space run there. Some of them go towards the bladder th this way and some of them go towards the uterus. The bladder ones which we need to separate, they can't be seen. So the best way to do it is to clip just these veins, which are deep uterine vein and the vesicle vessel joining the deep uterine vein. So if you clip those veins, then this area doesn't bleed, then you can push it for away and then take the bladder pillar. That's generally what I do with this particular space. It's the posterior vesicle uterine space, which is important. It's the same picture of the pelvic uh, anatomy which I showed. It doesn't appear like this. It all appears pink and white and sprayed. This is just a textbook description. This is the same picture of robotic surgery being done on um, the spaces. If you see, this is the interlilac artery, pararectal space, the ureter going here. And then you see the superficial uterine vein here underneath, just underneath going in. I'm dissecting the interlilac vein, which is, which is which appears like an amoeba most of the time. It's not the simple, uh, good looking vein which is sitting there. It has got many, many, many tributaries and it doesn't look, it can look anyway. It can look like a well, it can look like a rod, it can look like anything, but be careful about this vein. If it starts bleeding, you have to open up. You can't, most of the times if you do injuries here, it's not easy. So you have the deep uterine vein here and the parasympathetic nerve here. So separate the deep uterine vein from the parasympathetic nerve so that you spare the uh, nerve in nerve sparing uh, hysterectomy. Where am I? I don't know. Uh, okay, that's, I'm doing the Kabashi space here. I've done the um, uterocycle. This is the uh, uterocycle ligament. So whatever is looking white here, remember the fibers of uterocycles also look white. So be careful not to leave uterosacral in the pelvis because that is what is needed for radical hysterectomy. The uh, other side, I showed you a lateral to medial approach of approaching the deep, uh, the, the veins and the uterine arteries. This is a medial from midline to lateral approach. You need to learn both tricks and traits because um, sometimes when you have not done a lymphadenectomy, that side it's all uh, in obese patients is difficult. So you move from here and it is done well. So this is the tunnel again, the uterine vessels go slow because these things bleed. Don't be in a hurry. So the tunnel, so the uterine artery uh, is crossing the tunnel and you go ahead of the uterine artery after separating the uterine artery. You don't have to ligate. This is where you come into your bladder pillar area. Anteriorly, it's the bladder pillar. Ureter goes here and posterior to the ureter, there is a space called the abuki space, which I mentioned earlier. If you don't resect this space, the ureter always has a kink there. Sorry, I just went on. The ureter always has a kink there and you will not get your vaginal margins proper. So doing bladder pillar is important, but more important is doing the debuki space, which where it's the posterior UV fold, where the ureter gets completely separated and it uh, stays at the lateral portion of the pelvis. And you can do your clamps for the vagina as much as possible. Now, since 2000, I think 15 or 14, I'm, I don't open, I don't do a colpotomy abdominally for radical hysterectomies. I do a vaginal colpotomy. Initially, I used to uh, do, um, do the bottom bit first and then go and do the radical hysterectomy as explained by most European surgeons. But while doing 
uh, this particular technique once or twice, I opened the pouch of Douglas. Now, the problem with opening the pouch of Douglas is when you're doing your radical hysterectomy, the gas leaks all the time. So I modified the procedure. I do all the radical bits before. I do the parabetria, the para vagina, everything before. And then in the end, I come down and sit and do the vaginal colpotomy and remove the specimen. So this is vaginal colpotomy. I feel this is a very important technique which everybody needs to learn. For gynecologists, it's easier because we've been doing vaginal hysterectomies a lot. But for surgeons, sometimes this, 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 uh, this makes you feel um, dextrous as well. You don't know which one is upside down. What is upside down here? So this is this is vaginal colpotomy. I'll play. This is very useful technique for radical tracheotomies, vaginal tracheotomies, etc. Uh, my residents always ask me, "Madam, show me how to do radical tracheotomy." But what I um, we don't get cases in India to do radical tracheotomy. Most women who come to us have had two children before they get cervical cancer. So in this particular video, I've tried to show what. It, what, what is a step which is important in radical tracheotomy, even though this is not a radical tracheotomy video. Um, it's a simpler technique, radical tracheotomy. If you know how to do a radical hysterectomy, it's no big deal, laparoscopically or open or vaginal, it doesn't matter. So this is it. Let me play the video. Can you see the video? Sorry. Yeah, we can see. So hold the cervix, whatever you want. Now you can take as much vag vagina as you want. In this patient, the disease was inside the cervix. So um, I've taken uh, around one to two centimeters of the vaginal margin. Remember, these are young women. Don't overdo things. Don't underdo things for oncology, but don't overdo things for uh, quality of life. So you put a circumferential, circumferential incision around the vagina, all around the vagina and around one to two centimeters of the vagina. This is posterior vagina. And then move the vagina as a flap towards the cervix. Be careful not to move it here because there's bladder there. So move the vaginal flap towards the cervix. So because, uh, uh, this is the step I'm putting a sounding. This is the radical tracheotomy step. What we do, we put a, a sounding to see exactly where the internal os is. Once we know where the internal os is, we cut the vagina, we cut the cervix and the vagina somewhere below it. Once you've cut that, all you have to do is to suture the uh, cervix, which, which looks like a tube, to the vaginal edges, the usual stumped off sutures we used to do in uh, in uh, Manchester method of vaginal hysterectomies, modified vaginal hysterectomies, the same trick. So I'm showing the residents where to cut. If I'm doing a radical tracheotomy, I would cut here because the internal loss was here. Once I cut this whole specimen, I'm left with a tub tubular cervix. All I have to do that way is to, uh, is to suture the vaginal edges to the cervix keep the knots outside the cervical canal, endocervical canal so that it doesn't get stenosed um, uh, in radical tracheotomies. So I close this. Most people do this and then go up and do the radical hysterectomy, but I do everything up and come down and not expose the uh, cervical tumor to the abdominal cavity. And this is just a peritoneum. If you have to clear your lateral vagina, otherwise you get this thick tissue. So once you've done that, you close the vagina. That's a specimen. You can take as much vagina as you want. Um, that's, um, that was colpotomy, vaginal colpotomy, much used in radical tracheotomies and uh, hysterectomies, radical hysterectomies. This is a robotic inguinal femoral node dissection. This is all in exploratory stage of evidence. We need to be careful when we do these procedures without uh, 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 knowing what we are doing. It's, it's dangerous because in vulva, again, leaving notes uh, is not salvageable if they're positive. This we presented it in, uh, I think, ESCO or IGCS last year. Okay, now I've done a few modifications to this technique. Just immediately, initially, I to put the uh, robotic ports at two thirds and one third of the thigh, and I used to. Uh, this is the apex of the triangle and I used to keep uh, 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 creating the uh, uh, space and then put in uh, and then start uh, 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 looking for the vessels. But what, ha what used to happen was at this point, the sartorius starts coming from like this to here and the vastus medial is also comes. So the thing is the nerve, the, the muscles don't come with a name on them. They all look the same color. 
So sometimes you go into a wrong plane and you're searching or you're on the vastus medialis, your assistant is pushing from above saying, Madam, this is sartorius, this is sartorius, but actually you're gone in the wrong plane. So what I started doing was putting this incision high up here. Here, if you'll see the vastus medialis is already gone, I'm right bang on the sartorius, which is in front of my eyes. So if I put my ports here and create a negative space, I create a space with my hand, then it pick, see this, this is the apex and I just have to put my finger and I'm at the apex. So I'm showing both uh, the techniques where I, I've gone wrong once or twice and then I realize I need to do a little differently. So this is how it looks when you create a space, everything looks pink. You don't know which muzzle is what and um, till you this thing, till you till you dissect all the, uh, this thing and thigh is a very small organ. It's not like abdomen that you can uh, roam around and look and see and things. If you see the vastus medialis is coming into picture and this sartorius is here. So if you start going in a in this direction, you start the sartorius moves up into the wall. So you have to be careful. This is the sartorius and don't go underneath this. If there's too much fat here, you don't see this muscle. You start going here, searching for the sartorius underneath here. You, you, you don't get confused with this, but you start searching for sartorius underneath the vastus medialis, which you don't get. Once you see the sartorius, it's an easy game in, uh, in, in, in whether it's open surgery or whether it is laparoscopy or robotic. Um, so you, you track it to the uh, AP, uh, anterior superior iliac axis and then you come down. And then the medial border of sartorius, you start looking for the vessels. You get nice, beautiful magnified pictures here. And it's an anatomical surgery. It's not like Vardhaim's. You don't get surprises in groin or dissection. So you keep moving up, you see the femoral vessels, you see the septenofemoral junction and uh, it's the same um, method. I lift, um, if you see some of the urologists, urologists, they come from above uh, and then uh, and then go to, go to, the, go to the deep inguinal uh, femoral nodes. I go from the femoral inguinal femoral nodes and go upwards. This is on top. You have to be careful for uh, about buttoning here, basically. Um, you keep asking your assistant how much uh, illumination they're getting there so that you're not going into the thing. You, If you have done your open uh, groin node dissections, you know the planes where you're supposed to um, the scar pass. Hi, Harish. So this is a saphenous uh, vein at the, at the other end. It's dilated because we have clipped it at the proximal end, which helps in identification. And you keep moving. When you see the white, be careful. Don't don't buttonhole. And I I really think this is one indication which is really useful for the patient. No pick scars. Uh, they these surgeries do break as well. It's not that the wound doesn't break when you do a laparoscopic or a robotic groin or dissection, but the breakdown is small compared to compared to um, uh, the open surgery where in the middle, the patient stays for two to three weeks. However good you do an open uh, groin or dissection, almost all of them break down. If they don't break down, they end up with an emphasis. So you are between the deep sea and the devil in, the, in groin or dissections. When you go back on post-operative uh, wards, we've been doing groin, open groin nodes for such a long time with all those broken wounds. It's, it's a pleasure to see these patients Move around. I keep the drains for uh, around seven to ten days because it's a closed space. It's not abdominal cavity. In abdominal cavity, I don't keep drains for anybody even for parietics. But for groin, we keep drains because there's no peritoneum to absorb the lymph. So this is one one more tiny um, uh, uh, video. I have a uh, uh, laparoscopic ovarian transposition. It's an easy technique. I do not know why it has not been used in India. I really, really do not know. We've done around 50 cases of robotic, uh, sorry, laparoscopic um, uh, um, LOT, uh, ovarian transposition for colorectal cancers and a few for uh, um, bone and soft tissue and lymphomas. And um, two thirds of the, I will be publishing the series in the next couple of months. Two thirds of them menstruate, the survivors. Um, and hardly we have seen crook and bug. And it's a normal looking ovary with no peritoneal disease is when I select less than 30 years, I select because I don't have 40 space to do it on all the women. But I think less than 35 is ideal. What I, what I say, tell my residents is to cut the ovarian ligament longer, longer so that you can hold the ovarian ligament instead of fallopian tube throughout your surgery. This surgery has to be done 
with a little bit of um, um, you, it's 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 a fiddly surgery. It should not be too close to the infundibular pelvic ligament. It happens that if a hematoma starts here, whatever reason you are trying to do this surgery is it fails. So go very very lateral to the infundibular pelvic ligament and keep moving the peritoneum. The whole point is not to handle the infundibular pelvic ligament and the fallopian tubes uh, to prevent hematomas and bleeding here. So move up to the pelvic rim. The, the principle is to move the whole ovarian cow complex above the pelvic. It's just not the it's just not the ovaries. If you want to improve the success rate of anotis, you have to move the whole complex above the pelvic rim and also don't kink the complex, the infundibular complex. And when you're suturing it high above um, uh, for anchoring, don't suture the fallopian tube because already you've clamped the fallopian tube on one side. And if you suture the fallopian tube on the other side, you end up with uh, functional or, or uh, retention cyst and they cause problem because at the end of the day, you're dealing with cancer patients, any cyst, anything in the abdomen sort of sends a scare wave to uh, uh, patients. And sometimes people have done um, gone back and removed this ovary and it has come back as functional cyst. So um, I see all these patients uh, in gynae OPD so that there's no misjudgment in terms of functional cysts because they're used to physiological cysts of gynecologists. This is the brim. We are coming up to the ureter. This is the only place where the ovarian vessel is very close to the ureter. So monopolar is a better instrument here. I use uh, ligature only because I'm in a teaching institution and I get worried when the resident starts moving the monopolar up and about here. Uh, so I teach them with, uh, uh, with Maryland's. And once they become experts, then I ask them to use whatever instrument because they would have learned uh, the soft skills of handling tissues. Shall I follow fast forward it? I think I'll take it too much time. One, two more minutes and it's fine. I'll just fast forward to see if it moves fast. So I'm moving the complex about, this is about the pelvic grim. This is what I meant. You can move even further because remember uh, ovarian vessels come from iota. So it's easier to move this in one of the last, generally I move it up to the subcostal margin, just close to the liver. And one of the last patients who was, I did on an event sarcoma, 14 year old girl, her abdomen was so small, so small. I thought by the time she grows, this ovary will be sitting somewhere very close. So I mobilized it even harder and then put it above um, the, the liver in between in the subdiaphragmatic space. It goes up till there, you can ma manage to do it. I put a tunnel in the peritoneal cavity so that it is ovary is a heavy organ. So um, I put a tunnel in the ovarian uh, in the peritoneal fold so that it, it stays there, and I also put a stitch there uh, so that um, it stays there. Remember, for a short course RT in colorectals, it's a, the, the ovary should not fall for four to six weeks. After that, even if it falls, it doesn't matter. All these women will need IVF pregnancies. Putting it back, I think, is a waste of time. It's it's a waste of time. Thank you. I think um, that's it from my side. Can I, shall I stop sharing? Yeah, yeah, you can stop there. That was indeed a brilliant presentation as I expected. Thank you. Actually, uh, uh, yeah, actually Dr. Subramanian Rao only introduced you to me uh, telling that uh, you are the right person to uh, to talk about uh, kind of conco surgery and that uh, proves uh, he was right. A uh, uh, lot of uh, uh, stalwarts are joined this uh, forum now. Dr. Palaniveru is there. Dr. Manjusha Litake is there. Dr. Subramanesh Rao is there. Dr. Danny Rosen from Israel is there. So I request them to stay on. Um, uh, and now I request uh, 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 Professor Nerja Patla to take over for the uh, moderation. Thank you very much, Shaila. Thank you, Dr. Vaidu. Shaila, that was excellent. I mean, it's amazing how much ground you have covered so succinctly and summarized so much in, of your experience, just putting literally in a nutshell. So I'm not even really sure where I should be starting uh, to cover all the topics that you have done. But I think I'm going to start uh, from 2018 uh, back when the LAC trial was published, because you have alluded a number of times to the surgeons involved. Yes. And actually 2018, if you recollect, we had the FIGO meeting in uh, Rio, uh, when I was just finishing my term as chairperson of the oncology uh, committee of FIGO. 
and uh, I wanted a lot of people from India to come. But unfortunately, because IGCS was going to be in Rio the next year, many people preferred to stay back, not wanting to do Rio twice over. So we had an excellent, excellent oncology thing. We, as you know, we presented uh, the revised staging of cervical cancer at that meeting. And LAC had just been published and we were in Brazil. So we invited many of the surgeons who had been participants in the, the LAC trial to our oncology workshop as well. And we had the opportunity to chat with them. So I would actually believe that there is less of problem of the type of quality and the control of the surgeons in LAC than there is perhaps in SEER, which is a larger, much larger and uncontrolled database. I think in LAC, there was a reasonable understanding of what kind of surgeon there would be. And there are some variations, but the very fact that so many people have subsequently found similar actually itself, I think, proves that point. In fact, there was a very interesting presentation recently. Uh, we had, I'm a council member for Asian Society of Gynae Oncology, and we had a Taiwan workshop hybrid recently. So I hope they will put it up uh, soon and I will send you the link. There was a most brilliant presentation from Japan about the LAC trial and the aftermath, which he likened to the five stages of grief and he said that we had, and he showed all the papers so beautifully, the denial, this can't be possible, the anger, how can this be possible, the bargaining, maybe we have a smaller tumor, maybe we tie up the vaginal vault, maybe we do a conization beforehand. So the bargaining, the depression, when there's more data coming out that is not quite supporting, and finally the acceptance. But I think the problem basically lies in the lack of presentation of data. I think all of us who talk about it and hypothesize about it do not actually analyze and present our data. This is the problem I faced when I was revising the cervical cancer staging also. A lot of people would write to me and say, I feel this should go into this stage or I feel this should go into that stage. But you have to publish it. We have to be able to quote why we are changing a staging. So I would really encourage people, even if it's retrospective, look into your data, come out with it. Let's understand the facts. When we made the cutoff at two centimeter for 1B1, 2, and 3 now, it was actually based on survivals from trachelectomy data, which showed much better survivals of those women who had less than two centimeters uh, size of tumor. So now the same thing has been extrapolated, but it doesn't necessarily work for the same uh, reasons, really. So um, I think the way to go is trials. And we have now the first GCIG group in Kolkata by our eminent clinician scientist, Dr. Asima Mukhopadhyay. Unfortunately, her uh, focus is more on ovarian cancer as uh, she has been involved with PAP development and all that. But I think we should have similar other groups also to do some trials and have our own, uh, let me see. And one more point I want to make before I start addressing the questions posed by various people, and there's been a very interactive audience, pertains to the cost of the robot. And I want to throw this thought out. And this is something which is being followed at Memorial Sloan Kettering, where they charge the same amount, whether it is robotic surgery or laparoscopic surgery. And the argument they give is that we do not start charging more for MRI when we get a better machine. We do not charge, uh, change the charges on account of the superior technology. This superior technology is offsetting other costs, offsetting hospital uh, stay, offsetting uh, readmissions, and so on. And they do not have a different package. So I am not as Shaila and I have the disadvantage of being in the same situation. We do not understand the business of medicine. But I would like to leave you with the thought from people who are carrying out a business. So yes, as uh, Dr. Uh, uh, I do, as said already, we have very eminent people. And the very first question came from Dr. Subramaneshwar himself, who wanted to know, Shaila, would a metal cannula not be better for a scope and camera? I mean, we also do metal cannula for scope and camera. 
but he has asked you this question and he has asked also whether you close the 10 mm tow cars under lap vision. Uh, metal, uh, the metal one is uh, the steel one which we used to use before. That's, uh, that's what you're saying? That's what he means, I think. Yes. It doesn't matter what you use. Yes. I doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, Dr. Subrana, you can you can unmute and ask the question directly. I, I understood it. It's my question. Uh, Nirja Bhatla asks it much more elegantly. So I, 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 I kept quiet. <laughs> I got it. I, I, the type of channel I you use is not going to make a difference. But if you're doing an open technique, most of the surgeons do an open technique. I do the optimum method. So I'm used to putting the plastic cannulas with a scope in and enter directly with that thing. So with metal cannulas, um, you can means you can use anything. I think I can't see any reason why one. Taylor, no, no. Uh, the fogging because oh. of the wall uh, is something that is in your control in a in a Hassan stroke car, for example. The oh. length can be controlled, and then the fogging is a little less when when the scope touches the 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 wall. Oh. That is when it, it gets fogged up as we are entering inside. So if it is a metal stroke car. The number of exchanges of the scope, cleaning and exchange, or uh, heating it up, heating the tip exchange, is hmm. this is something that is understood. If you use both, you would understand that. You used to use the uh, really for sure. a long time, and then I moved on to this, and now I operate like sometimes uh, it's so uh, hazy, or the assistant is doing. I say it's like winter in Paris. I can't say anything, but since you know where the uterus is, you just keep nodding <laughs> and operate. Yes, I understand what you're saying. I, I, yeah, fair enough. We can use. Dr. Rao, you have another question regarding the fallopian tube preservation, right? Correct. Yeah. I, can you can you See, ask? Uh, we, we always remove the tube, yeah. Shanshala. Yeah, yeah. We always remove the tube. Yeah. Do, do you have any reason why you would want to preserve it? For the transposition, you are saying. Yeah, yeah, correct. yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. I, yes, I have an obvious reason. The thing is, the uh, adenex or the ovary and the fallopian tubes uh, are, are one organ actually. They are just sitting together and called different organs. There are lots of vessels between the fallopian tube and the ovary. You can just do the ovary itself. Remember that ovary is just a like a seed like organ, and just to handle the ovary and move it up is more um, um, cumbersome than moving the whole adenexal complex up. The second thing is, um, you might devascularize the ovary a little bit because if you carefully look, there are vessels coming from the infundibula going towards the ovary mainly and some two, three vessels going towards the fallopian tube as well. So when you're trying to separate the fallopian tube from the ovary, sometimes you might cause a hematoma backwards into the ovarian tissue. Yes, a good surgeon, you, 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 can, you can get your ligature and uh, do uh, or um, bipolar and may, make sure that it doesn't cause a hematoma. The thing is, why do you want the fellow? Uh, the second thing is, apart from the technique and the vascularity, why do you want the fallopian tube next to the uterus? Why? Because the whole point of fallopian tube is to catch the egg from the ovary, and I'm moving the ovary up in the uh, up up in the right uh, costal margin. If I have to put back the ovary again in the same position, do you think that ovary will be placed in such a beautiful position that the fallopian tube will come hunting for the egg? No. So the fallopian tube sitting next to the uterus for me has no functionality at all. In fact, it makes my life miserable while I'm operating that little tiny vessel between the, those two bleeds. And then to hold the, just the ovary and move it, move it up is more difficult or cumbersome, I would say, not difficult, instead of the whole adenexa coming up. So I, I, we, I've yeah. tried both methods and I felt finally at the end of the day, this works beautifully well. And I can't see other than IVF, I can't see any way these girls are going to get pregnant. So why bother about the fellow? And anyway, it gets blocked by that amount of surgery we have done there and amount of radiotherapy they get in the, uh, this thing, that fallopian tube is going bound to be uh, a non-functional. It's like tuberculous fallopian tube. The endo and and uh, the endo things. Uh, uh, I think we're dealing with two different situations. Yeah. One is a situation like a radical hysterectomy where we have removed the uterus. We are concerned that in case she is requiring the radiotherapy, we may have to uh, uh, give her radiation. Of course, if we had a clear reason, we would not be doing the surgery. And now we have only the ovary to keep. And the other may be a condition which is a non-gynec malignancy 
or even maybe a CA cervix stage three where you want to keep the uterus and you want to move this ovary out of the way. But I agree with Dr. Subramaneshwar that we do not keep the thing and removing the tube, it's, I mean, it's become pretty routine now to do the salpingectomy. So it's not really something I would say has caused concern. To my mind, removing it makes it easier to bring that ovary up because it's a, a lesser dia that you are bringing through that tunnel. And it also, I find very useful if you just put a stitch through the ovarian ligament side of it, and that stitch can be used to pull uh, the ovary into the position that you want it. So remove the tube completely or leave the tube next to the uterus is the question. Uh, it see, the, 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 I don't think there are any many ways to roam, they say, whichever is useful and whichever technique is useful, you can do that. Removing the tube is okay. And removing, keeping the tube up above is also okay. Uh, but while dissecting the tube and the ovarian vessels, you have to be careful. And that is that is the cause of the problem, not keeping the tube or but removing the tap also have to be careful. There may be bleeding from the fimbrial end or something if you are even uh, tapping. Yeah, you, can't hold the, you can't hold the fallopian tube when you're handling so it. happens as it's being pulled up. Three, 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 advise um, advise um, keeping the ovaries up at all. The reason being, even though they're young women, the, the fact that the ovary is sitting next to the parameter at the back of the uterus where the disease is being uh, spreading in terms of the squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma. So I'm worried where the ovary will be involved in those, uh, in those uh, patients. And sometimes we have done uh, 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 salvage hysterectomies for patients who've had post-CTRT, who've had some residual disease in the cervix the ovaries looks entirely normal. And when we have taken out the um, hysterectomy, radical hysterectomy and ovary, the ovary would have had microscopic metastasis. So I'm very uh, worried about um, 2B, 3B ovaries because the parameter is too close to the ovaries and ovaries get might get involved that. Stage one, yes. Adeno definitely, I would say, is, an, uh, is not to be considered in this respect. But squamous is a small chance and it depends on the patient and it depends on her ability to afford hormone replacement and and i think it's a very individual decision yes i agree with that so there were many other questions also shall we move on to them dr baiju yeah please please uh, question from dr anil Maktoum, who wants to know about your take on nerve, uh, nerve sparing radical hysterectomy should it be something for all the patients of course, now we talk about uh, the radical staging in terms of the curlew mor moro um, classification. We don't really talk of one, two, three anymore. But yes, Dr. Shaila, would you like to take his question? See, for one, uh, I don't think there is any controversy for less than two centimeter tumors because they're small tumors. Some of them are leap biopsy tumors. They're called stage one, but they're not stage one B1, but they're not uh, obvious. The in the the non-seen tumors and less than two centimeter visible small tumors. I don't think there is any controversy with uh, terms of uh, radical uh, so radical hysterectomy, nerve sparing radical hysterectomy. Now the uh, problem is uh, two to four is also most most people around the world do nerve sparing radical hysterectomy. If you carefully follow up these patients where you've done your radical hysterectomy beautifully, putting all Heaney's clamp all down the uterus sacral, taking a nice chunk of disease. Many women have atonia of the uh, uh, bladder anyway to start off with even before the radical hysterectomy now especially in our country and, and all you need is uh, uh, get the nerves in your clamp and and they keep coming back and they keep coming back and you get around one to two percent patients needing self-catheterization forever self-catheterization it's, it's around 10 percent do need some do have atonia and they keep coming back and forth and we teach them self-catheterization for some time and in a year or two they become all right but last ninety percent of them are okay. Ten percent have got uh, temporary problems for a year or two, and one to two percent might need uh, bladder catheterization forever, self catheterization. And it's not easy for an uh, lady who is coming from a village to self catheterize, boil those red rubber catheters. It's not easy. So if I can spare the nerves, if I can spare the nerves without compromising on oncological outcomes, which is basically B1, B2, less than four centimeter tumor, it's fair enough. But B3 tumors, I don't operate. I don't operate in more than four centimeter tumors. I feel B3 tumors themselves are very big sitting in the cervix and already in and around the cervix, if you want to get a good parameter, your nerves are going to go. You will be compromising on oncological outcomes for B3 tumors. B1, no doubt. B2, see how you go, how, how much parameter you can get without getting the nerves, without with moving the nerves away. 
and it's a tricky tricky method now sparing is not an easy method people talk very nicely show beautiful uh, uh, diagrams on nerves but it's not easy when you're operating identifying all those nerves pushing them so follow i follow a few principles get all the tissue below the deep uterine vein down get all the tissue lateral to the uh, uterine sacral outside and clamp so you don't have to go around dissecting and finding which nerve is what just use a common standard principle common sensical approach uh, take what you are supposed to take and leave the rest that that's what i said so it, yes nerve sparing can be advised in most of the cancers at the moment at least in operable cervical cancers we we are fine with nerve sparing and dr sunil kaushik wanted to know your extent of nodal dissection in centrally recurring or the salvage hysterectomies for residual ca cervix following ctrt how much of nodal dissection would you do now in uh, we we don't get so many of those patients most of our patients would have had ctrt or large recurrences um, these days we are doing um, initially my uh, the teaching was small recurrence on the cervix we go ahead and do a pelvic lymph node dissection up till common iliac vessel bifurcation or up till uh, aortic bifurcation if there are no nodal disease then you go ahead and do an exenterative surgery or radical hysterectomy in post ctrt scenario but now the the, the indications for exenterative surgery are changing it is not like you have to have you if if there is parametal involvement the other two weeks back we did one patient who had parametal involved post ctrt uh, but i could i could feel the uh, uh, the looseness of the tissues in the lateral pelvic wall so we did an exent uh, lateral layer and an exenterative surgery on this patient and um, we remo removed the lymph nodes as well so general rule of thumb is if the lymph nodes are positive there is a chance that what uh, the, the 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 longevity which you are going to give with exenterative surgery might not be high that's the standard but if i remove all the lymph nodes if they are negative and i do a parametrectomy or a layer or a, or or an exenterative surgery then the survival outcomes are really really good for cervical cancer but yeah, the same question was there by dr vinod kumar that if pelvic or paraortic nodes are positive is rt required or not if you give rt is there morbidity or not so that should be seen up front i mean uh, if, as you start that should be your first step to check that out if the nodes are positive then th there and then the surgery may be abandoned if the nodes are positive uh, pelvic nodes are positive we abandon the surgery but uh, the radiotherapist gives one uh, the radiation one above the one field above the positive nodes if um, i've done till common iliac bifurcation they go above and do it till aortic bifurcation when they give the radiotherapy so they cover the next set of nodes in the common sensical logic approach that if you, if these are involved they might be involved in 50% of the times um what was and uh, if uh, for uh, early cancer how much how, uh, what is the level of nodes the standard template has always been i showed you the central nodes for cervical cancer they're all in the obturator fossa and they're all below the common iliac bifurcation so i feel for cervix probably that's that is enough you can go up to the common iliac and remove a few nodes till they join the aorta um for um, endometrium sometimes we might have to go up because of the ovarian vessels and the fundal growth which might come up cervix the template is standard for last 25 years the template has been standard for lower parietic nodes the recent trials phase 2 trials for bla blanc and go et al and others the lilacs are all coming up there is a 15% incidence of metastatic micro metast sorry not, not micro metastatic nodes in the parietic region um and uh, i did speak to leblong when i put up the palace trial he said uh, only do below ima i have not found nodes between ima and para uh, and renal vessels in uh, in locally advanced cervical cancers so um so nodes below ima is fine i think above ima is taking it too far, further for ca cervix this is i'm talking about advanced ca so 15% of the no negative nodes are positive for cervical cancers um like uh, pet negative nodes or ct negative nodes and if they are micro if they are less than 5 mm 5 mm nodes positive nodes if we give radiation extended field radiation to those areas the survival is the same as if she did not have a no positive node if the if it is more than 5 mm or if it's going up to the capsule or capsular spread of the node then the the scapula may falls down so positive nodes big nodes are always a cause of concern they get the survival to less than 50% in whatever you do you remove not remove extend the radiation field the survival comes down yes microscopic the thing is you don't want the dual uh, morbidity of both surgery and rt and you have much better 
brachytherapy, when you have a uterus intact where you can get your tandem right well into the pelvis and get good isodose curves coming out of, of that, rather than having a shortened vagina post-radical hysterectomy. So it's very tempting once you're in there to want to complete the surgery, but that's not a good option for the patient. I would urge all the audience to read the BRAX trial, which has come up. Uh, it is abandoning radical hysterectomy. It is just, I think, last month publication by the European group. Uh, abandoning radical hysterectomy following uh, positive lymph nodes on, uh, uh, on uh, operable cervical cancers. And uh, there is no benefit of doing radical hysterectomy. And the morbidity of the bladder and the rectum is high when you give radiotherapy in a patient whose uterus has been removed. Um, so that's a trial. And I, I've also put up a retrospective analysis uh, in our uh, the N0 and uh, N1 notes. What do we do? We, we abandon the surgery. So I, I, hopefully in two, three months, I'll get the results and publish it this year from TMH. Thank you. Dr. Nutan Jain is also here. She's a very good MIS surgeon. Nice to see her on this. She's also asking a question about fluorescent imaging for sentinel node uh, sampling. What is your opinion on that? And uh, I think this is now CE endometrium. Dr. Sarika Gupta had a question whether frozen section of nodes in CE endometrium is recommended or not. Right. Um, for uh, I, Sorry, I couldn't show the central node. Uh, we do central nodes for endometrium, um, the green dye. Um, uh, what, the one, um, uh, one thing I would advise is when you start doing central nodes, um, you read the FIRES trial, you read everybody's trial, but what everybody, you have to learn the trick. There's no point reading all the trials and you still do not know the trick and you mess up with the whole thing. So when you inject, your assistant is injecting at the bottom and you're sitting in the, in the robotic, uh, this thing, or you're doing a laparoscopic surgery, and then uh, the green dye is all over the place. It's all over the place in the uterosacral pouch everywhere. So it's very important that technique is learned. You go through your learning curve of how to inject the central node, how to identify. It's not, it's not a big, it's not a big technique or a huge technique, uh, but it has got its own nuances. So you need to learn the nuances of the green dye. We've all been doing blue dye for I think nearly in the last 25 years. We know what it is. It just seeps everywhere. And after that, the whole surgery, you're just seeing a blue screen rather than a nice, beautiful white screen. Luckily with green dye, it's much better. Uh, uh, so yes, well, central nodes uh, can be done in endometrial cancers, early endometrial cancers. I put up the slide on the guidelines for NCC and estroesmo guidelines. Intermediate, low intermediate risk, definitely central nodes can be done. Um, um, but go through the learning curve first uh, and identify the nodes. And then uh, don't, sometimes you remove something and it's a dilated lymphatic. So you, you learn your own um, uh, technique and then go ahead with it. The second thing is, uh, what was the question? Um, the frozen section for sentinel nodes. Oh, no, the fro I don't know, frozen section for sentinel node, I think should not be done because you have to do ultra staging to know whether you're, that's, that's the whole point of a stay, looking at the validation studies for cervical cancer. It's very inaccurate when you do a frozen section for a central node. Um, the central node is positive. You go ahead and give an EBRT to the whole pelvis. If you are within a trial, you then go about doing, or when you are a beginner, do the central node, do the lymphadenectomy, correlate your central node with lymphadenectomy, see if your technique is right, and then make plans and arrangements. Uh, what I generally do is the ones I know they need a central node, I do. But I'm still not convinced with uh, endometrium is, I think we're splitting the hair too much with endometrium and lymph nodes. I do not know whether anybody is going to leave or not leave because of what I did in endometrial cancer. We talk too much about endometrial cancers and I don't think it's worth talking so much about endometrial cancer. It's an easy cancer. You remove whatever nodes you want, obturate to force and a few external, go, not go, don't go around removing so much nodes that she ends up with lymphedema for the next 55 years of her life. Um, I like I, reminding me of my teacher, <laughs> Professor V.L. Bhargav, recently she was saying to me, Nija, we never went into all this, but our patients lived so well and lived long enough. And there is so much discussion now. <laughs> so this is really reminding me of that. <laughs> but I think if you're seeing a node, for example, and it's like CA cervix, you open, you're seeing something grossly looking suspicious, you get a frozen on that. That's a different story where the pathologist will give you a yes, no. But when you're talking about Sentinel deciding your plan, then I think you need the ultra staging kind of a system then. Then you go with the Sloan Kettering philosophy that you will send it 
do routine histology and in any case then if it's positive you're not going to bother about the rest you're going to give them the adjuvant the only little help i feel central node will help would I, would, would help me is um, this one or two percent parietic central nodes which might be lurking around which i wouldn't have bothered doing it if i put in a green diet if the lymphatic is going up above the presecal area and up into the uh, ovarian ligament then I know somewhere um, uh, the central node is there, but that's not, that's again, very rare. Hardly you see that. Uh, most of the times you see this uterine artery, vessel and a green dye going here and there in the obturator fossa, which I would have removed anyway. So, um, so I do not know. For high, high risk patients- You're you talking about it helping you to get the right nodes, but you're not talk, saying that that changes the pathologist's uh, no. sort of orientation. The pathologist low, low, needs but, to be groomed and uh, sensitized simultaneously. So low risk, no no myometal invasion. I don't do lymph nodes. I inter low intermediate risk. Sometimes I, I dabble with a green dye and do this and that in the obturator force and come out. I'm not convinced what 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 is right for the patient. High risk patients, I do lymphadenectomy, irrespective of what it says. Also, I've seen in India a lot of enlarged nodes not reported by our medical by radiologist. They are all sitting there. Not, CT scan is absolutely normal, and you go there and you see a little nice node. Now, these nodes, I do not know how they affect the central node mapping in India. We are still looking at Western literature and saying they're all fine, we have we can do this and that. But Indian scenario would be totally different because we do get enlarged nodes, the tuberculosis or infections or whatever. And we still need validation from Indian point of view uh, for central nodes before we make decisions on to do lymphadenectomy or not do a lymphadenectomy. At the moment, I'm not deciding my treatment based on central nodes, I do lymph nodes uh, when I think I need to do, and I don't do lymph nodes when I don't think I do need to do. So uh, there are a couple of questions related to port placement from Manish Jitani who wants to know, is the assistant professor in the robotic, uh, is the assistant sport 10 mm, 12 mm? And uh, there is a question uh, regarding the port place position. Is it same for paraortic node dissection? I think this was not quite clear to them. And then there's also a question whether you will do the paraortic with the pelvic lymph node for the fundal uh, tumors. No, I do the pelvic lymph nodes. If they're negative, I don't go around doing anything. Um, if they're positive, we go up. If they're serous tumors, I go up and uh, remove the momentum and do the paraortic. I showed the few slides on the port placements for when I've decided to do a pelvic lymph node. All my TMM ports are in the midline. One is uh, slightly above suprapubic, one is either on the umbilicus or above the umbilicus, and I change the camera port from top to bottom when I'm doing uh, uh, laparoscopic uh, high up. And then I stand on the right side. My assistant is standing on the left side with a, uh, he's more, he or she is more static holding the duodenum or holding the left sigmoid, uh, basically. So I stand on the right side, put two, ports, uh, two, uh, put two five mm ports on the right side for my working uh, ports, and I put 10 mm. And I change the camera port uh, from the, uh, from one to another depending upon upper abdomen or lower abdomen. For robotic, uh, robot the problem laparoscopy is easy because you can change any anywhere you want. You can stand anywhere you want. You can move the patient anywhere you want. It's it's really versatile. I would say it's 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 you don't need to worry too much when you're doing laparoscopy because you need four ports in the four or five ports in the abdomen and then you can get on with life. But it's robotic. Once you put the head down and place your ports, then you can't do much about it. You are stuck with those ports. And even if you're clashing and you're very close to the IMA or the IRTI, you're still uh, uncomfortably operating. That's one disadvantage I always felt when I have to do up and down in a robotic port uh, compared to a laparoscopy. Laparoscopy, I don't find any problems. So as I showed you before, uh, if I plan to do a paraitic, I would have put the ports for robo below the amylicus. Um, as I said, it's very uh, close to the pelvis, but it's okay, pelvis you can manage somehow because we've been doing it for a long time, paraitic area. I'm a bit more careful because the complication rate is much more higher in paraitic than pelvic area. Um, I've shown the port uh, placements for all types of surgeries in my presentation. I, you can go back and look at it, I think, later on sometime if it's recorded. Yeah, it'll be up on the uh, tube. In fact, uh, we had two people who identified the foreign uh, visitors. We had Dr. Ali Lali from Baghdad and Dr. Madriz from Nicaragua, and they were asking about the they wanting the links, so will they will get it for the YouTube, I'm sure. I just wanted to touch on a little few tips and tricks for beginners, especially, and you may have even 
noticed the vasopressin soaked gauze which was lying in uh, Dr. Shaila's uh, uh, videos on the side. It's useful to put that in in anticipation when you are uh, doing the surgery for lymphadenectomy. It was very helpful if some user or something comes to not have to waste time to get that gauze in to give a little pressure. So I always uh, think one should put that off. And uh, regarding this going below the obturator nerves, it, the first person I saw doing that was Carl Podrats. But honestly, we've never seen recurrences in that area below the obturator nerve. So right. why do we want to go down there, you know, and uh, uh, do that dissection? It doesn't make sense. If there's an enlarged node, you need to go. Otherwise, definitely yeah, yeah, not as a routine. Not okay. as a routine at all. Okay. That because is, you're going to kill the patient. Not required. And then again, if you go lateral to the swas is also one way where you can identify the obturator and lumbosacral trunk and follow it down below. And sometimes it's very helpful if the patient is obese to get you the right mark and you don't cut the obturator nerve with yeah. your cautery, which will make the resuturing a little more challenging after that. And uh, what we do uh, like to do uh, most times is to do a distilled water wa wash in the end. I'm not sure how much it helps or doesn't help to uh, catch hold of the spill, but it, we found it doesn't do any harm. And we do a wash for those endometriums. I even wash uh, the, uh, uh, the vault from below is what I would say. I was a little concerned about your statement regarding the suspicious adnexal masses of large size in young girls to decompress. I think that has to be individualized. Please don't take that as a routine. Please look very carefully at the risk of malignancy. If the risk of malignancy is low, it makes sense to do it with the precautions Dr. Shaila said. But if the risk of malignancy is high, it's much better to give a nice clean incision and a good subcuticular suture and the girl will hopefully benefit from it. So look at each case individually and what is your what are the odds that this is going to turn out to be malignant, I would say. I would like to add a word for this because um, uh, all the scare of um, rupturing the ovarian mass and upstaging the disease and causing poor oncological outcome is based on high-grade epithelial serous ovarian cancer. And to some extent, mucinous tumors, which become pseudomucinous. You spill it all and it all goes around the abdomen and later on they come back with a mucinous tumor everywhere. 20, less than 25 year old women, I, I think I have not seen in high grade epithelial ovarian cancer. I've not seen a high grade epithelial. So most of them are borderline tumors. Most of them are mucinous tumors. Some here and there, low grade probably even low grade comes a bit later but you can get low grade so to get a p53 positive high grade epithelial ovarian tumor in a less than 25 year old girl is a rarity in that case, so in that case whether i rub i do a cystectomy on this patient laparoscopically or open or i leave the ovary behind some ovary behind or remove the whole ovary I do not know that to put in the risk of, we, obviously we don't put the risk of malign, in, malignancy index in these patients because it doesn't, many people, the, my residents read RMI and then say, Madam, our RMI. RMI doesn't work for this patient. There's no RMI for these patients. So you be caref, uh, careful is what I say, but I understand uh, anything is okay. As long as, even though they say it gets upstaged, the surgical upstage of an 1CA controlled rupture has no oncological outcome, uh, uh, sequelae, if it is high grade anyway, she'll get chemotherapy. If she's low grade, she'll not get anything. Or even if you give chemotherapy, it's not useful. Borderline doesn't matter. So I'm not sure actually with adenexal masses, many people do laparoscopy. The ones which we get to Tata Memorial are the ones which are really, really uh, looking miserable and horrible and uh, this thing. So, and most of the times when we have tried to remove them, they're, they end up being borderline cancers rather than anything else, low grade or borderline. And some mucinous. And can be washed well with 5% dextrose. That's a good option for a mucinous spill. Yes. So uh, there's one, I think, almost last question, I think, that um, uh, do you use a cattle brush approach or do you use the midline approach? For uh, paratics? Yeah. I don't know. I thought that cattle brush was for aneurysm, so I don't know. No, basically um, moving the bowel away from uh, wherever the parietic region and getting the renal vessels nice and laid out like Dr. Subramanish, Subramanish showed the other day. Um, 
we, we, we have come from a gyne angle, remember? We have come from pelvis and we have moved upwards. Um, I don't know, surgeons where they moved from, I do not know, they're all over the place and they claim expertise in everything they do. So uh, what I have always, <laughs> what I always done is to move on the vessels, keep going up, keep going up. Open method, it's very easy to cauterize the duodenum, get your renal vessels high up and this thing. Um, first of all, I find it hard to find an indication to do parietic most of the times in my practice, uh, other than the high grade endometrial cancers. And even them, their nodes are not enlarged so much that I'm struggling to find this thing. Sometimes uh, germs, uh, dysgerminomas, we have had nodes on those areas, but I've done open surgeries because of post chemotherapy stuck nodes like testicular tumors, and I've done open surgery rather than laparoscopic approach for these patients. So I go on the peritoneum, move the bowel. In robotic, it's very easy. The duodenum, you can go under the duodenum, push everything. You can see each fiber of the duodenum and you're not scared of the duodenum anymore. And you push it up and you see the lateral vessels and you remove all the tissue. Laparoscopy, I, I approach the same way. I pull the duodenum up and go underneath the duodenum and do it. I've not done the uh, uh, moving the bowel as we do in open surgeries for gynecological organs, as, except for dysgerminomas, post chemotherapy, residual masses on on the vessels stuck. Uh, but I do open surgeries for them. I uh, I am not comfortable doing. These are prophylactic lymphadenectomies. Remember, in what we do in gynecology is prophylactic lymphadenectomy, so we don't overdo things. We've had some good comments from Dr. Rupinder Sekho, from Dr. Shalini in the chat box. I think we have some very illustrious guests uh, with us. If anybody's questions are remaining, they can again repeat them in the chat box. But I think we've more or less covered it all. And if we would like any comments, Dr. Baiju, from any of our um, uh, illustrious uh, uh, some, uh, some of the guests has uh, already left the place. Probably after seeing some videos, they will uh, usually leave. And uh, I request anybody who wanted to talk uh, can raise their hand or can uh, unmute and ask a question or a comment uh, uh, if any comments are there. And uh, I request Dr. Nisha also, if you have any questions, please put uh, the questions there. It's not easy, sir, Sunday evening to keep all people together. No, you just you imagine have... 10 o'clock till uh, 116 people are there. That means that uh, they'll mangle more. <laughs> PSR has given the last word. He has said staging lymphadenectomy is always better done from midline. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Leshmikant is there. Uh, Leshmikant, can you uh, just unmute and uh, ask your question or uh, you can put a comment? Uh, hello, sir. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, like, excellent lecture, sir. And uh, very often uh, uh, we see, uh, like, gynecologists calling us because the uh, tumor, uh, they don't expect tumor, some spillage in ovarian malignancies. So, they thought it's benign and the biopsy comes as negative. So, uh, I think uh, from madam's experience, uh, so what do you do, madam? See, the thing, fortunate or unfortunate thing is I'm working in a cancer hospital uh, tertiary centers for a very long time. So some of the simpler ones don't come to us at all. They are just get diagnosed and done laparoscopically or whatever way uh, in, in uh, district hospitals or with general gynecologists. So the real experience with adenexal masses is with general gynecologists, to be uh, honest. And most of uh, the good laparoscopic surgeons in gynecology do a very good job putting them in a bag and sucking them without a spill and taking it out. And remember, these are 17, 18 year old girls. And um, it makes sense to me that if you can give them no scar and remove it in a bag without rupturing it, yes. But once in a while, one, one or two patients in 100 will come with a spill, with a spread. And we get those patients and we get become paranoid about this spill in, because we, we, we see only those cases which were badly managed and sent to us. So we still wouldn't get a clear picture of what would be right for a larger population, uh, adenexal masses in young girls, if they're not looking suspicious, as I said, high-grade ovarian cancer, epithelial serous ovarian cancer is non-existent, non-existent in an 18-year-old or a 22-year-old or a 23-year-old. Mucinous, yes. 
immature teratoma sometimes you can't make out these are the two three conditions where you might go a bit wrong but otherwise most of them are benign functional cyst if you can put it in a bag get it out without spilling and go ahead and give a quality of life but a small so, is also so, very so centimeters i think up to 10 centimeters is a good cut off which you can definitely get into a bag and get them done safely and so, in any case it's worth putting in a scope to take a look before you decide to open in such a case when the biology of the disease is lost because uh, you are uh, removing it as a pin, uh, piece meal so like the biology of the disease is lost though we know we have not spilled any tissue still the fear is there uh, what uh, how we have staged and the, what the pathology says that's what so, i said in a borderline tumor it doesn't matter because there's no disease anywhere borderline tumors anyway the indication is to do a cystectomy and leave the normal ov the even the affected ovary you can do a cystectomy and come out so it doesn't cause oncological problems in borderline borderline tumors the high grade tumor anyway you're going to give chemotherapy for the smell so it does, again doesn't matter in oncological perspective for a high grade tumor so germ cell tumors never never put a scope in you land up with a port site metastasis two days after you operated on that patient so uh, the spill uh, the, the the concern for spill came uh, from anyway we uh, hopefully diagnosed with her markers yes yes and regarding a ruptured cyst ruptured cyst but it look at uh, the you done uh, excision but on a laparoscopy you saw it's a ruptured cyst this is a young girl unmarried 27 years so the cyst uh, has been removed but comes as malignancy so because it's ruptured like the staging and uh, we don't know so how do you want to help her because recently we had such a case so the ct abdomen said uh, it was a large fibroid we went in it was a ruptured cyst so we removed uh, in toto completely but uh, we don't know what to do because we of course we refer to our senior oncologists they are taking care but uh, just for our i mean advice what do you advise us what to do Shaila, I think has gotten logged out somehow. Uh, so, uh, what did the uh, pathologist say? This was because of the rubs. The cyst was. No, it's a malignant uh, epithelial cyst. Epithelial ovarian. But, yes, yes, it's a, a epithelial, epithelial malignant. And she's a young girl. Young girl, young girl. I think it becomes a dilemma. This is whether you should immediately go in to do another staging laparotomy or whether you should keep her on a follow up and see how it goes uh, yes. beyond that or whether you, so I mean we do have advanced imaging techniques to our health now we do have uh, the benefit of good uh, tumor marker also uh, to f see the case so sometimes we would go in and do the uh, staging completion and sometimes we would just leave them to be followed up depending again on the individual case. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Dr. Shaila has uh, actually um, uh, accidentally or some. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, she has. Uh, she has to. Ramaneshwar uh, wants to say something. Uh, she wants to. She has to read doc now. Yeah, yeah. The problem of robotics. Uh, I sent a message to her. Uh, she has logged it. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Subramaniam. Uh, uh, Baju. See the uh, uh, question on uh, the approach for uh, parotid lymphadenectomy. In a gynae setting, it's very unusual to need a kettle brush or any other bowel mob mobilization because most of them are staging procedures. Uh, there is a, a big difference between a retroperitoneal lymphadenectomy in gy gy gynecological cancers and testicular cancers. In a non-seminal matter, germ cell tumor which needs an RPLND, all of them are salvage RPLNDs, and uh, and the the tumor would part would have responded so well that that there is there is such intense desmoplasia and uh, testicular tumors you keep seeing uh, nodes around the renal artery renal vein retro uh, cable and things like that so there you need to do these bubble mobilizations and there it's much more often open surgery than minimal access very rarely does anybody do minimal access in these procedures desmoplasia extensive disease which would have responded Testicular tumors need these bubble mobilizations most of the time, almost always. Gynecological cancers. If it is a parotid lymphadenectomy, it is a midline approach. What Shaila uh, very clearly told: continue with the vessel. You have already dissected the common iliac. Uh, continue to dissect and and reach the renals and complete the procedure. 
മിഡ്ലൈൻ അപ്രോച്ച് can you hear me okay yeah, yeah yeah i agree with i agree with dr subramaneshwar rao because there's extrapolation of all these testicular tumors and lymphadenectomies in other cancers to gynecology and somehow in gynecology we're fairly decent with lymph nodes uh, they are not the ones which which really give us trouble radical is the only one i think and <laughs> primary site reductive surgery which gives trouble to gynecologist and the learning curve has to be really good with those two surgeries rest is straightforward yeah yeah uh, i think uh, uh, there are no more questions or no more comments i think uh, this is a time for winding up uh, actually it's uh, uh, 10 o'clock now it's almost 100 people are there uh, in the forum uh, i actually uh, thank uh, dr sadashree for accepting my invitation uh, uh, and uh, delivering a very wonderful uh, lecture and also the videos and also uh, professor nirja badla for uh, accepting my invitation on my request and uh, and dr nisha for uh, uh, introducing the speakers and also uh, dr subramaneshwar rao for introducing uh, me to dr uh, uh, sadashri and uh, you know, and uh, uh, all the other participants for logging in and the data was of uh, uh, this uh, evening uh, the youtube link uh, for the recording will be available in senadbin education foundation you can subscribe senadbin education foundation youtube link and the, uh, this will be available from uh, um, now onwards after 10 minutes so thank you all for uh, uh, for logging in and i uh, request uh, dr uh, uh, the presenter and the moderator to give their final comments I love. I should talk. Oh, five yeah. minutes. Means. Um, thank you very much. I. It's lovely. I. Uh, the, the thing is, um, to uh, most of the times when you give lectures or any presentation, it's just fifteen minutes, and somehow you're trying to squash things into a, uh, the whole uh, webinar, and it becomes complicated. Or moderation, where um, every time you are asking ten, fifteen people what they feel, and somehow we don't come up with uh, a, those are all good ways of uh, education. But I feel to call um, a, a people, call them experts or people who are experienced in that field and have been doing things for a long time. They, it, it is very useful in surgical field especially because this little tips and tricks which we give um, or which we take from others goes a long way. Uh, as i said surgery can't be learned in one day it is a lifelong process you keep learning every time you see somebody's video you said oh he is doing better than me or she is doing better than me i should do this. so this sense of competition also the sense of sense of learning and i think your organization has managed to do that well and for surgeons it's a great platform i would say platform thank you thank you thank you for the comments and uh, dr nirja badla Yes, I think it's been very interesting uh, for me, and I have to say that it was only after I was invited to this that I got to know about this wonderful uh, foundation's work. And I watched the previous video also; it was very illuminating. And I hope people have learned from this, and I hope they take away the message from Shaila that minimal access is here to stay. Everybody has to learn if they want to survive as surgeons. the techniques will keep evolving the indications will keep evolving but broadly it's something to learn and knowledge of anatomy is the essence so do take the opportunities and even if you get opportunity for cadaver dissection do please try and do that because these are the things that really help us to understand the orientation i think the robot takes over i think takes over the surgeons we keep uh, doing mis <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you uh, dr shaila and uh, dr nidya badla for uh, again uh, for accepting our invitation and uh, it has been super presentation and a super moderation and uh, i request to you to uh, to to be in touch with the senadvi education foundation for uh, future gynec topic also uh, uh, thank you once again and thank all the participants the video will be available in senadvi education foundation youtube link the next webinar will be on uh, on uh, the holy plane of field uh, 
uh, it is done by a rj hewlett himself and uh, please uh, uh, log in uh, on 11th april 2021 until uh, then bye thank you all once again thank you thank you sir good, good night good job aju good job thank, thank you. you thank you sir thank Anna, you ninja uh, as always amazing great yeah. job thank you thank really you. enjoyed the yeah thank you thank you can we leave now thank yeah you. you can leave